Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 103. I'm your host, Derek Moore. And this week, we're going to follow up on what we did last week. So Jay and I were on, of course, linked to that. That was episode 102, 102, where we talked about the GameStop craziness, the short interest, gamma squeezes, you know, why gamma squeezes and options can, can cause the underlying stock price to go up. And, you know, just some general discussions. If you haven't already checked that one out, I would urge you to do so. I thought it was a, a very good episode. And thanks to uh, Jay Pestercelli, Sega Financial, of course, from uh, for coming on once again. He is at this point a quasi semi-permanent co-host, whatever that means. So, all right. So last week, obviously the big news, but I, I still think there's a lot of misunderstanding, bad information Uh, on anything from naked short, short interest, failure to deliver, short squeeze, how margin works. You know, you heard the news about uh, Robinhood had to take in some extra capital. Why didn't these companies, or I guess AMC, kind of quasi did a secondary offering because they they had a convertible bond. I'll get into that. Why doesn't GameStop, GameStop, GameStop do a, uh, a new issuing of equity. And then just kind of thinking again, we touched on it last week, you know, are short sellers good or bad? Uh, the reality is they, they really can't run a company into the ground, but there's some interesting angles to look at both on the upside and the downside when price gets a little out of whack. So with that, let's get into it. So the first thing is the whole notion of, of short interest. And you know about the short interest ratio. There's the percent short of a float. There's the short interest ratio, which looks at the volume on a stock, days to cover. And interestingly enough, you know, when the volume of gain stock went up and up and up, it actually made it easier for the shorts to cover um, because more volume, more liquidity. But there's still a misunderstanding about you know, the short interest. I saw, and I, by the way, I got a lot of questions on last week's episode. And part of this is let's let's kind of delve into it a little bit more. Let's clean up some things. But I got a notes, a couple questions from people who sent me the link to the SEC website, uh, NASDAQ site that uh, had the short interest. And the important thing to remember is, you know, and, and the, the reason why I bring it up is because they uh, they were saying, look, you know, GameStop, look at all this short still that haven't covered. And one of the things I had to point out was that those numbers are not real time. So there's only twice a month that the official numbers come out. Uh, the NASDAQ releases theirs, NYSC releases theirs. So those that short interest that you saw was not up to date. And I know people have said, well, wait a second, I'm seeing a lot of stuff on CNBC and I'm seeing stuff on, you know, Twitter and websites. But yeah, I mean, the reality is they're only required to report the short interest twice, uh, you know, twice a, a month. So I'll link to that. There's uh, uh, on the NASDAQ. Actually, if you just go to NASDAQ.com, if it's a NASDAQ stock, you can punch in the symbol and you can see what the latest report was. The the ones, though, there's a couple of places that estimate it. I think S3 Partners is one of the ones that I saw. And this actually plays into the whole idea of the, the naked short. So you've heard a lot of stuff about hedge funds shorted millions of shares of, of GameStop. And as we went over last week, in order to, to short a stock, it has to be entered as a short sale. So it's a specific way that you, you had entered on, I was going to say a, a ticket, but it's, it's, of course, online. Everything's computerized now. <clears throat> but the other part of that is that all those shorts may not necessarily, in fact, probably they weren't naked shorts, and I'll explain. Um, the thing that S3 Partners has put out, and I'll, I'll link to it, um, I, you know, I, I don't, um, I'm not recommending it per se, right? Uh, But I've seen some interesting data from them, and they use some internal proprietary algorithms to sort of estimate short interest. But one of the things they point out on their site was, 
you know, and it, it, I always think about if you, if you start with just one share, okay? Imagine there was only one share of GameStop and it was trading at $100. It doesn't matter what the price is. So somebody had bought that one share of GameStop. It's sitting in a, uh, a margin side of account, which means the broker's firm is able to lend those shares out. A short seller, um, there's one share available to short. The short seller goes ahead and sells it short. Uh, they've, they've agreed to, uh, or they, they've arranged to, to borrow the share where the brokerage firm just, you know, some firms or some platforms will show shares available to short. Um, other times, uh, if, if a short sell doesn't go through, you might have to call the trade desk and see if they could do what's called a locate. And they'll try and see if they can borrow it from another firm. But in, in that case, right, you got your one share. Now somebody sells the stock short. So one long, one short. But here's the thing. Somebody else bought those shares from the short seller. And so now uh, you've got one, one long, one short, and you've got a, another long sort of synthetically, right? And then those shares could be uh, in a margin account, let's say at a completely different firm, and those could get lent out. And so one of the things that I've seen S3 do is they, they estimate it based upon, you know, all the synthetic uh, holdings that are out there as well. So a couple things here uh, before we move on. Number one is the short interest that you've been seeing passed around. It may not be up to date. Uh, the second thing is that just because there's more than 100% of the float, it doesn't necessarily mean that those shares are sold short naked, naked meaning that they were unable to be borrowed. Um, so that, that's kind of an important thing. And you're getting into some some semantics and you know internal things that normally nobody really talks about, but I've, I've gotten a lot of questions from it. Uh, the other part that I'll, I'll just mention is that, you know, if let's say you shares don't settle. Okay. So, so it's called failure to deliver. And this can happen on the long side or, or the short side, but the SEC actually comes out with a report. I'll, I'll try and link to it in the show notes. It's called the failure to deliver report. And when you go into it, you can download it, use control F if you want to search by a symbol, but it will show you, I think it's over the last month, might be over the last month, the last two weeks, might be every, uh, every two weeks, but it will actually show you the failures to deliver. And so what does that mean? Well, let's say, here's an example. So let's some, say somebody was short a call option. And when you're short a call, you give somebody else the sort of the right to, uh, uh, to take shares of that strike price. You got to deliver stock. Well, let's say now you're short stock because you got assigned and the firm tries to see, and, and if you wanted to hold it as a short position, I'm getting into some semantics here. If they're unable to locate it, you know that might uh, uh, wind up being a failure to deliver. Um, you've got some settlement things here. I, I don't want to get into the, you know, the crazy details of it all, but um, you'll be able to see any failures to to deliver there, and I'll, I'll link to that. The other thing that I'll mention too is that. Just because you see a short interest, those are shares that are, uh, you know, reported as being short. But the reality is that, you know, a lot of, you can do a lot of things with options. You can, using just calls and puts, you could synthetically create a short position without ever needing to sell a stock short. So think about it. The problem that, uh, you know, some of these funds want wind up having is, you know, when you're short a stock, the stock can go to infinity. As we joked about last week, I wish I've, I've bought stocks that went to infinity, meaning on the long side. I never seem to get a stock that goes to infinity. But when you buy a stock, the most that you can lose is whatever you buy it at to zero. With a short sale, if you short it at 100 and it goes to 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, you, know, you pretty much have unlimited loss. So the characteristics of a short are defined, you know, you can only make to zero and you can lose unlimited. 
And so those characteristics are similar to uh, combining, let's say, a short call and a long put. Now, that would be a, a, a synthetic short. Um, it has tons of risk if it's not hedged because you've got unlimited upside. And the other thing, too, is I'll say is when shares are tough to borrow, typically you'll see the put prices start to increase. The premiums of those puts will increase. And so it gets expensive to synthetically short. But I bring that up because, you know, that's uh, that's an important point. And the other final point before I move on to some of the stuff with Robinhood and margin, and I've got a lot of questions on those, is, you know, just because there is a high short interest ratio doesn't mean that, let's say, a fund that is short shares hasn't hedged that unlimited, you know, downside to the upside, right? You have unlimited loss to the upside. So who's to say that some of these firms didn't have uh, some hedges and hedges meaning, you know, protection on the upside where they would gain in value as you're losing on your short. So um, I, I just thought it was worth mentioning because um, anytime there's something in the news like this, you see a lot of people come out of the woodwork. You see a lot of stuff written. Um, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, individuals that haven't really been in the markets that long. And even in the media, I've seen some, some, uh, you know, some stuff that really wasn't complete, not all, uh, but some stuff that was, you know, a little bit less than complete. So, okay. So the other side of this is, you know, firms taking risks. So somebody had uh, asked me a question, how can, how can a brokerage firm lose? Like why, why would they limit risk on some stocks? So uh, you may have, I think it was reported uh, from like Schwab, they had GameStop, I believe at 70% re- margin requirement, and then they went to 100%. I think it was on CNBC, it was reported around the 13th of January. But uh, let me just explain how margin works. And I'm not, I'm definitely not an advocate for margin because in the long term, I mean, you're, you're really opening a lot of risk up and you've also got to pay margin interest. So... Uh, generally, in my opinion, it's it's not great to use. Um, so, but the way a margin works is, let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollar account. It's all, you know, stocks that are marginable, uh, no special requirements or anything like that. Uh, well, there's there's something called the Fed requirement, and that means you have to have at least fifty percent. So in that case, there's fifty thousand dollars available for, uh, you know, to buy other stock. And then firms have what's called a house requirement. And the house requirement is uh, usually less than the Fed, although it could be the same or, or higher. Uh, and they can do it for any number, you know, different stocks can be different. But let's say, you know, 35% is the house equity requirement. What that means is if the equity in an account uh, went below 35%, they may, you know, issue a margin call and then they might ask for more money or close out positions and things like that. Again, don't I, I wouldn't recommend going on margin. It's uh, you're really increasing the risk. You, you got to pay interest. Um, I've seen some some not great stuff with that. So the reason I bring this up though is let's say somebody comes in and says, you know, um, I'm going to use a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to buy GameStop shares. Okay, forget about the requirements for now, right? But let's say you bought that on margin. Um, so you buy, you know, two hundred thousand dollars at GameStop. You've got a hundred thousand dollars in equity, and you you bought it at you know three hundred dollars a share. Well, now if that goes down to one fifty, I mean it, it lost you know fifty percent of its value. The equity in that account would be zero. If it goes below one fifty you would have what's called negative equity, meaning you would owe the brokerage firm money. And here's the problem for brokerage firms and why they manage risk is that if you go negative equity, you know, if they can't collect that, if they, uh, you know, potentially they, they would have to sort of cover that. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of these risk controls are in place. And, you know, they... Uh, the firms have house requirements. There's something called Fed requirements. 
which is based on SMA, special memorandum account. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that is. So, you know, what happened with it, it, the reporting on Robinhood has been the other aspect of this. And that's when, when brokerage firms, uh, trades don't settle or clear instantly. It's not T plus zero. It's the trade date plus a few days. And so basically, you know, you do a trade, the brokerage firm um, goes through what's called the DTCC. It's uh, what's a good way to describe it. It's kind of like an escrow account, right? And so it sounds like what's been reported in the Wall Street Journal, I was reading the article, and the, the clearing mechanism they made a call to Robinhood said, hey, you need you to deposit more cash on hand at the at DTCC. And so it sounds like, you know, and I, I, all this will sort of come out. I don't have any reason to believe that they, you know, were trying to help hedge funds or anything like that. By the way, a lot of hedge funds made a lot of money uh, last, last couple of weeks. So there were some winners, there were some losers, but... Um, that's part of it too. Trades do, don't settle instantaneously. In fact, it used to be the trade date plus five days. In other words, let's say you did a trade on a Monday. Uh, yeah, the trade date, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, it wouldn't settle until the following Monday. And when they went to T plus three, trade on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, it would settle, right? But think about this. If it was T plus five, the trade date plus five days, and you were selling something and you wanted to, you know, you were waiting to take money out. Imagine you did this on a Friday before a holiday weekend where Monday's a, a trading holiday. So you used to be able to, you used to do these trades, you'd do a sell on a Friday, and then it would be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday, um, Monday. You know, do it on a Friday, you wouldn't settle till the following Monday. So anyway, I just I bring that up because there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes and firms are required to have capital. And I don't, you know, I have no insight into, into Robinhood or anything like that. But um, and certainly if they had people on margin, that would, uh, you know, exacerbate things as well. Because for the reasons I mentioned, you know, the firms, when they let people trade on margin, there's a risk to the firm if positions move so far against that, you know, the accounts wind up holding negative equity, right? So um, the other thing that I think is worth talking about is um, a couple of people asked me, in fact, I, I made a comment on last week's show. I said, hey, you know, if I'm GameStop, I would do a secondary offering of stock like yesterday. And I said that, but of course, you know, the, the reality is that there's a little bit more involved. Um, so this goes back to companies, when they go public, they do what's called an IPO. It's an initial public offering. And during an IPO, what they do is they say, we're going to issue this many shares at this price. And, you know, then you're off to the races. You've probably seen... Uh, you know, recently, what's the what's the one that came out recently? I can't think of it right now. It's kind of a big one. Oh, didn't Airbnb come out? I think Airbnb came out. So you issue shares. And depending upon the type of IPO, whether it's a direct listing or, you know, a, a normal listing, um, sometimes that money is is goes to early investors or insiders. Um, other times, it's it's raising capital that the firm can then use. So they can raise capital. The other way that they can raise capital is they can issue debt. They can issue bonds. And with a bond, of course, it means that you, uh, you agree to uh, essentially take a loan, and twice a year you're paying interest at some rate, and the bond has maturity. At the end of maturity, you've got to pay back the, uh, the bondholders at par, and if and sometimes firms, you know, issue new bonds to pay off the old bonds and roll the debt. But um, and then there's also convertible bonds that could be issued, and convertibles have an embedded option. And so uh, the bond holder at some point could decide um, take the option and convert into shares of equity. And we saw this. I think it was Tesla. They had some convertible bonds when Tesla went up. 
Um, and when AMC, when the price went up, uh, sounds like there was a private equity firm called Silver Lake. It was reported that they own convertible debt um, that was issued about 2.9% annualized interest rate. So they decided to convert and AMC wound up uh, you know, issuing shares. And so in that case, they got rid of the debt. They issued shares. The good news is they, you know, they raised some capital. The bad news is, of course, um, for existing shareholders, they did get diluted, um, and that's that's one of the things. So, the idea of doing, um, and then of course you can do what's called a secondary offering, which gets to the point on on GameStop. On a secondary, what happens is you go to the market and you issue new shares that get added to your existing ones. So you're diluting the existing, you're increasing the shares, which, which dilutes the shares a little bit, right? Because if you owned 100% of a company and you sold off 50% of your company, you now only own 50%, right? So a uh, good example of dilution. So then um, the question of why they didn't do it, like why didn't GameStop issue shares at $400? Um, I've been reading in, you know, a couple of commentaries on this. Um, you know, when you do a secondary offering, typically... The company has to explain what they're going to use the money for. I think it was David Faber on CNBC had mentioned, you know, they, they could just say it was going to be for general purpose. Uh, it was also reported, too, there's a, an article in the journal that pointed out that, you know, if they issued shares at $400, um, they would have to, they would almost be doing so, quote unquote, um, I guess I'll quote and then I'll close the quotes, at a price that, that they know isn't you know, the right value, end quotes. Okay, that was in the journal. And so one of their points was they might be reticent to do that because they're worried about, you know, getting sued on the back end. Um, so I'll, I'll try and link to this stuff. But um, so anyway, that that's that's one of the things that, you know, people said, hey, why don't they just issue it? That, that could be one of the reasons there. And when you do a secondary, of course, you know, a lot of times institutional shareholders would have to take the extra agree to do the extra shares. So um, that remains to be seen. Uh, but AMC is an example where they, they got rid of the debt, the company converted, they issued new shares. Uh, I don't think GameStop has done anything yet. So to be determined there. All right, final thing we'll, we'll kind of go over is the idea, are, are short sellers evil people? Can they actually run a company into the ground? I gave the example last week where I said, look, if Apple, if I won $1.5 trillion or $2 trillion in a lottery, and that was my cash prize, and I went and shorted every share of Apple, and it caused it to go to you know a penny a share, does that mean Apple's out of business? No, of course not. It doesn't. I shouldn't say of course not. It doesn't. And here's why. Uh, they still have the revenues, they still have the earnings, they still have all that stuff, they still have their operations. Like the share price doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if your share price does, goes down, it doesn't mean you go out of business. Um, in fact, you know, if I shorted all of Apple stock and made it go to a penny, guess what could happen? Uh, number one is people who thought it was worth more than a penny would certainly come in and buy it and help get it back to its quote unquote right price. But the other thing that the company could do is Apple's got cash and companies do share buybacks. And it's just another way really, it's an alternative to dividends. So companies can return capital to shareholders. They can pay a quarterly dividend. Other companies, they use uh, money that's not reinvested into the business and they buy back shares. It's the opposite of dilution. It's, it's reducing the share count. And so- um, just another way, it's a quasi-dividend, but it's it's different. So imagine if I caused Apple to go down to a penny, and I think we we would all agree, I'm not recommending Apple one way or another, but I sure as heck think it's worth more than a penny. Well, Apple's board could authorize uh, buybacks. Apple could go and buy back their own stock. And if it was at such a low price, divorce from the real value, what a great opportunity that would be for the company. So, you know, short sellers in themselves don't necessarily cause the 
a company to go out of business. I think that's a there's been a lot of bad information about there, uh, out out there, and I've heard some politicians say, you know, how dare these short sellers uh, make a run at companies, cause them to go out of business. That's that's just not true. So, the other interesting thing too in the short squeeze is, you know, let's say the price goes up to a level that's that's so divorced from reality that, you know, maybe a company wanted to do a secondary offering, but there's no way they could justify uh, issuing shares at, you know, $400. Um, that's, and also here, here's the other thing too. Maybe there's a company where they would be better off, and I, I, again, I don't follow GameStop, um, but XYZ company might be saying, you know what, it might be good if somebody, a bigger company or a healthier company comes in and does a merger with us. Well, here's the problem. If, and then now we're doing the flip side, if price is too high, who would buy the asset? Who would buy it at those prices? So in a weird way, there are a couple cases to be made that, you know, doing a short squeeze and, and bidding up a company could actually be detrimental to the company. So, you know, that's that's sort of the other way around. Um, but here's where I touched on this a little bit last week. It is true, though. I mean, if you, if you have a price uh, that gets pushed down and a company wants to do a merger, part of their currency is their stock. And so when their stock is, you know, higher, if they want to do a merger and do a stock deal, you know, they let's say they do a, a buying a company for $20 million. If, you're, if your stock is, um, or $200 million, if your stock is 200 bucks a share, well, that, that takes a million shares if they want to do a stock deal. But if your stock is 20, well, now it would take 10 million shares. So it does hurt in, in a little bit of way. It t- takes away some optionality, you know, if they wanted to purchase something. Kind of the, the inverse of what we were just talking about where, where price is too high. The other thing that could happen is if they want to do a secondary offering and prices sitting below what the quote unquote market value is, they may not be able to to raise as much cash or they have to go out and issue shares and dilute the existing shareholders, you know, at a lower price. Um, And potentially, you know, you might see um, some impact on how rating agencies view the debt, view the bonds, some things like that. But I, I just, I got to reiterate, I mean, just the stock price, you know, if, if Apple stock price doubled, um, does it really do anything to the revenue and, and the company? And some people make the argument, you know, if if they're really, really strong companies, then it, it really, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't matter at all. So anyway, I bring that up. I think I've gotten a lot of questions on that. Uh, you know, we've covered everything from short interest, failure to deliver. There's those, those SEC things. Talked a little bit about how margin works. I wouldn't advise trading on margin. And, uh, you know, touched on secondary offerings and, um, you know, just some of the, the impacts when, when price gets too high, it gets too low. And I always remind people, too, that, you know, the value of something and the price of something is really two different things. Anyone who's ever sold a house knows or bought a house knows that, the price is what a buyer and seller agrees on. And that can change depending upon, you know, really supply and demand or, you know, what everybody thinks about the market. Sometimes people are more willing to pay a higher price than not. Um, but the value is is really different than price. And so just because price goes up or down doesn't mean the value really changes. You know, a good example of this, we'll stick with Apple, their cash flows, their free cash flow, quarter to quarter, it does not, you know, move around that much. But their stock price is certainly much more volatile than their revenues and their, you know, their cash flow. So just something to think about. All right. I uh, appreciate all the the notes. Uh, glad people are liking the content. Please share this with uh, someone that you know, maybe someone that you don't know. That's okay. You don't have to know them. You can just share it. And you know, rather than wasting time rating and review, you can rate and review if you want. I guess it, it always helps. But I, I appreciate the, the comments and the questions. As I said before, most of these, uh, the ideas for, for these podcasts come from, you know, listener suggestions or, or notes that I get. So uh, by all means, uh, let me know if there's something you want us to cover. 
All right, folks. We'll be back next week with another episode. Take care.